This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. It is May 2015, on the way to the Detroit Metro Airport. A family of mom and dad, the son, Billy, and there is a sister and her husband. Billy Riley is of great interest at this moment because he's headed to Moscow. Why is Billy going to Moscow? What do his parents make of it? Is the subject of a new book. The Lost Son, an American family trapped inside the FBI's secret wars. I welcome the author, the distinguished Wall Street Journal correspondent, Brett Forrest. Brett, congratulations for your work. A very good evening to you. Who is Billy Riley at this moment and what does he think of himself? Good evening to you. Good evening to you, John. And thank you very much for, for inviting me on your program. This is going to be a really interesting talk. Uh, who was Billy Riley uh, at that moment? He was a young man who had come of age after 9-11. He was in high school at that time. And that, uh, that one event uh, diverted the path of his life. Uh, he, he developed a, a great, uh, deep interest in uh, global conflicts, world religions, foreign languages um, that, uh, that developed at a time, a perfect time when the internet itself was, was in its own adolescence. And, and Billy uh, Riley began learning uh, uh, about the wider world through the developing internet uh, from his parents' home outside Detroit. Um, and his internet traffic caught the attention of the local FBI office in Detroit. And an agent came to the house uh, and was impressed by Billy's uh, abilities and knowledge and invited him to, uh, to come and, and, and work for the FBI. He is then a category of an informant called a CHS. His mom and dad know this. His sister knows it. And maybe some other people. But Billy is striking in that he has not traveled widely, except in his imagination and what the FBI calls a keyboard commando. Prior to this trip to the airport in May of 2015 on his way to Moscow, in December of 2014, several months before, mom and dad and his sister and brother-in-law also took him to the airport. But that time he was on his way to Manila. He didn't make it. Why Manila and why did he back off? What was that mission about that, that didn't come to anything? Right. Well, Billy had spent five years working for the FBI in Detroit, and uh, he, he was handling ever more interesting and, and potentially dangerous tasks. Um, one contact that he made was with a woman or someone appearing to be a woman online uh, out of the Philippines. And this person was suspected to be uh, an associate of Abu Sayyaf, uh, the Islamic uh, terror group in the Philippines, which had recently uh, pledged allegiance to ISIS. And now Billy had developed quite a relationship online with this person. And, uh, and he was preparing to go visit her. Uh, in the Far East. Um, and it's unclear what the purpose was, whether it was uh, romantic or otherwise, or as I mentioned, if this person was a woman at all. Um, he, he went so far as to go into the airport and check his luggage before he had second thoughts. And he didn't take that trip. But in 2015, May, as you mentioned, he was determined to go on an adventure. Mom and dad are important extremely so to this story. Terry and Bill Riley, especially Terry, who stays in contact with her son all the time. She had the phone call in December of 14. I'm, I'm not going to go, mom. Come and get, come back and get me. But in May of 15, he doesn't call. What does she think of her son at this moment? Why does she think he's going to Russia? Well, she, Terry Riley at that point is, is maybe terrified is too strong a word, but she's she's strongly concerned. She doesn't know why her her boy is traveling to Russia um, after having worked for the FBI for a number of years. He has developed a, a cagey way about himself. He's uh, become very adept at telling his parents just enough to keep them interested, but not quite enough to keep them completely informed. Uh, and this. Uh, this uh, he applied also to uh, to his Russia plans. Uh, he never really let them know the full story. 
Um, and they were, they found themselves ultimately to be powerless to dissuade him. Uh, they, they had remembered when he was a younger uh, boy in school and had troubles finding his way and finding his interests. Well, this was stuff that really interested him. And I think the parents were, uh, they, they, they wanted to encourage him into his interests rather than uh, prevent him from following them. But this, this was, of course, a different level because in May 2015, by that time, the war in eastern Ukraine had been raging for a year or, or so. And uh, Billy was uh, traveling uh, pretty much into the heart of it. We need to meet the men. Who are the men to Billy? And what part do they play in this drama between December of 14 and May of 15? So in 2010, that's when, when Billy Riley began working with the FBI as what's known as a confidential human source, kind of like a freelancer. Uh, doing all number of interesting things for for them. Um, the men. This is this was his name that uh, he developed uh, to refer to his FBI handlers. These were uh, these were agents, case agents working out of uh, FBI offices in Detroit and Troy, Michigan, um, who would basically would give him tasks, would would tell him the things they wanted to know, the things they wanted him to do, usually online. But uh, as the relationship grew between them, they started sending Billy out into the field uh, in the Detroit area under assumed identities, wearing listening devices with an FBI tail going after FBI investigative targets. So as Billy, Billy's relationship with the FBI became more uh, practical and material and, and potentially more dangerous, he started whispering around the house with his parents and, and referring to his handlers as the men. The night before he leaves, I think this is right, Brett, the night before he leaves, he goes out to dinner with the FBI, the men, some of the men. What do we know about that dinner? What did Billy tell his parents about that dinner? Again, another example of his telling them a little bit, but not everything and, and never quite enough. Uh, for them to to paint an, a complete picture, which would come into play later when they were trying to figure out where he was and what had happened. Um, but yes, he was on the eve of his departure for Russia when he had uh, many things to take care of. Uh, you know, obviously, packing for a journey like that and other uh, other planning. Um, he he left the house sort of at the last minute and uh, and went to go see his handlers. At least one of them, the main handler. Um, and it's unclear what they talked about. And the parents, especially Terry, his mother, she knew that something was up. She felt it. Of course, she had that parental intuition. Um, and she just didn't understand why he was talking to his handler right before leaving for Russia and why he wasn't being completely forthcoming with them. At this point, we move from Billy's point of view or Billy in the car to what happens next, but I, I I need to make a detail here. This is Oxford, Michigan, and Oxford, Michigan, is in a place in the in the Detroit area where there are many people who have Arabic, many people who've come from Arabic speaking lands, lots of Muslims in the area in general. Billy's Arabic is excellent, which is why he's worked with the FBI. How is his Russian at this point, Brad? Uh, you make a really good point. If, if I could just add a little bit here, I think it's important to note. So, um, you know, Dearborn, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit, you know, that's that's the location for the largest uh, Arab Muslim community in the United States. Um, and that's one reason why, especially after 9-11, the FBI really prioritized its work in the Detroit office. Um, Billy had grown up in Oxford, as you pointed out, which is just outside of what people uh, traditionally consider Metro Detroit, it's just north of there, which means it's sort of, it's a much quieter, slower place than some others in uh, the Detroit area. And it is kind of uh, a more traditionally American sort of uh, people of European descent and, and Christian. Um, but Billy began to gravitate toward the Dearborn area because of his interest in Islam and because of his interest in the wider world. Uh, and that is where a lot of his uh, FBI work was focused. And he told mom and dad that he converted to Islam. Is that correct? At this point, that that was okay with them? Well, that's right. After a year after 9-11, uh, 
uh, toward the end of 2002, Billy was attending, along with his sister, a Catholic school uh, in the Detroit area. Uh, the, the school required students to attend mass, it just sort of a, the traditional aspects of a Catholic school. But Billy had become so enraptured by um, uh, global conflict and religions and, and the wider world uh, that he was pursuing vigorous personal study at home, away from school, that, uh, that led him to uh, an Islamic conversion. Now, he didn't go to a mosque. He had no imam, no, no teacher. He did this all on his own. Um, and it, it, it resulted in a very interesting sort of tableau. He, he would often be sitting at the back of the class in, the, in Catholic school with the Quran propped up on his desk reading it. The book is Lost Son, an American family trapped inside the FBI's secret wars. Brett Forrest is the author. In May of 2015, Billy gets on the aircraft, continues on his way to Moscow. In December of 17, Brett is at the Washington offices of the Wall Street Journal, and he gets a call from Bob Forsman. What is the nature of the call, and what do you do about it, Brett? Thank you. So, Certainly, John. So Bob, uh, I'd known for a little while. He uh, is an American guy who uh, had been living and working in Russia and Ukraine since the 90s, working in the financial sector. Um, and he had developed a, a lot of very interesting and valuable relationships in, uh, in, in business, obviously, but also in, in uh, the power structure in both countries and, uh, and in the, the Russian Orthodox Church. Bob's a very religious guy. Um, and he and I had been meeting, talking about various events in, in, in Eastern Europe for you know, off and on for a little while. Until one day he told me we were sitting at uh, a cafe outside the, the, the ice skating rink at Rockefeller Center. And he told me that he had something that he wanted to give me, but it wasn't quite the right time. Now, as you can imagine, as a journalist, as a reporter, every time you hear something like that, you say, well, you know, I, I need to know what is it. It's uh... Anyhow, eventually, uh, some weeks later, I was sitting at, the, uh, at my desk in, in, uh, in the Washington Bureau of the Journal. And Bob called and he said, now is the time I'm ready to tell you. And this is what he told me. He knew very little of the Riley case, but he said there was a young man from Michigan who had worked for the FBI for a number of years in counterterrorism and had traveled to Russia and disappeared there. And shortly after his disappearance, uh, Billy's uh, FBI handlers visited the family's house, the Riley's house in, outside of Detroit, uh, professed ignorance of Billy's trip to Russia and began confiscating devices from the family and eventually shut the writings out. That's all Bob really knew. And I knew instantly that there was a story here of great depth, something that could be worth uh, putting real effort and time into to try and unravel. You get on your way to Michigan, which you know because you went to school there. It's winter time. You've asked permission of the Rileys to visit. They welcome you. And your first impression of Terry and Bill Riley, Brett? My first impression of the Rileys was that they were regular folks, kind, nice people whose lives had been turned upside down. Uh, and they were living through a personal tragedy. Having said that though, I saw that they maintained a high level of energy for their task of finding their son. And as I got to know them uh, and, and the, the issues more broadly of, of people who, who are looking for family members, uh, people who, because you know, this is not an isolated case, of course, uh, I realized that it's not every set of parents that uh, that have this kind of energy and drive. The Rileys were determined never to give up, and they were uh, they were very eager to uh, to find out if I could help them. Timeline: We accelerate now because there's so many details here; it gets overwhelming. Billy stays in contact with mom through the WhatsApp application, and gives them a travelogue, arriving in Moscow, meeting with two people, uh, Polnikov and Gorbachev, and then on the train to Rostov-on-Don, which is just outside of the Donbass area of Ukraine, where the war is. At this point, 
It is spring of 2015. The war is between the Luhansk, the Luhansk and Donetsk republics, they call themselves, and the Ukrainian forces. Billy travels to Rostov-on-Don to what is a, said to be a volunteer gathering uh, supervised by a name, man named Branya. What do mom and dad know about this place? Um, have they ever heard of it before? Do they think it's safe, Brad? They know very little. They know really only as much as Billy, their son, is willing to tell them. He's really the expert or someone approaching that level of knowledge. He has great enthusiasm for these issues and has been learning about them for years. Uh, you mentioned earlier that he, uh, he he taught himself Russian. He was very good with Russian, written Russian, uh, less good with speaking Russian because he hadn't had a lot of uh, practice. Um, but he knew the region, he knew the players, he knew what was at stake. And uh, the parents, all they really knew was that he was going to Russia, he was interested in the war in Ukraine, and that he was his goal was to join a humanitarian mission carrying food and medical supplies from Russia into Ukraine to be given to civilians there who were in need of assistance. That's sort of what he told them. But they never really fully understood whether that was true or that was all that he planned to do. There's back and forth with mom and dad through May into early June. And we come to June 24th when mom and dad are out on a bicycle adventure and they get a phone call. And what do they learn from that phone call, Brett? We have just a few well, 50 seconds. Right. Well, 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 Billy for some time had been uh, expressing frustration with his parents that he wasn't able to achieve his goal. He wasn't able to, to see the war himself. Well, on that phone call, um, he said plans have changed. They, the parents thought that he was on the eve of giving up his dream there and, and getting back on the plane to Detroit. But suddenly things took a new turn. Brett Forrest is the author, also a Wall Street Journal correspondent. And Brett's covered this story for the journal. And now it's a book, Lost Son, An American Family Trapped Inside the FBI's Secret Wars. Terry and Bill Riley, last year from their son, Bill, Bill, Billy Riley, June 24th, 2015. Brett Forrest travels there in December of 17 to Oxford, Michigan, and has a conversation with the family that engages him. Why? And that is one of the compelling subplots of this book, Brett, because your own travels as a young man were equally adventurous and risky. You traveled to Africa and you traveled to Russia. You spent a lot of time in Russia. So what were you thinking about after you left mom and dad and over the next year about Billy Riley and, and his adventure? Well, for me personally, John, it was, uh, it was always a sort of dual calculation here. One was uh, uh, as, as, a, as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal with professional responsibilities of uh, trying to uh, unearth interesting stories and, and important stories to tell, uh, but also um, filing regular stories and publishing regularly and meeting demands uh, of my editors. You know, I'm, I'm always looking at, the, I was always looking at this, this story, at least in the early stages, as I was trying to figure out if this was something worth doing, if it's something that the journal should do. Uh, but on the other hand, well, in, addi in addition, um, I had great, a great personal uh, attachment or um, interest in it because Billy had gone missing in Russia. You know, I had first gone to Russia in 2002 uh, looking for a sort of new adventure, a new chapter in my life. And I, my, my travels there uh, diverted my own path. Um, I ended up living in Moscow for five years. I ended up living later in Kiev. And I'd been working at that time in those two countries for about 15 years and had developed uh, a lot of friendships, a lot of professional contacts and traveled widely in both countries. So the fact that Billy had gone missing there in connection to the war between these two countries was something that was almost irresistible for me. Yes, quite convincing that you were the man at the right time, at the right place. So we're, we're going to Moscow with you now. And your contacts there include a private detective, Turin. Who is he? What do we need to know about him and his information? 
Yeah, Dimitri Turin was somebody that the Riley family had hired. Uh, they had found him online uh, shortly after Billy had disappeared when they were they they believed that the FBI was not going to help them and they had to do this on their own. Um, they needed help. They needed local help. And they found Turin. Uh, and Turin is someone that I eventually met that Riley's introduced us as I contemplated my own travel uh, to Russia to look for Billy. I thought it would be a good idea to or team up with Turin, or at least um, get to know him a little bit and see if uh, he might have information that would be helpful to us. Turin is, is a fascinating character, just to, for the fact that he's a private investigator in Russia. To me, that held a lot of uh, intrigue and mystery. Other people you wanted to meet, and some not. Is this an opportunity where you tried to meet Polenkov in, this, in that trip to Russia? Yes, that's right. So Mikhail Polenkov was the uh, was sort of the, the overall manager of the volunteer fighter camp where Billy uh, had found himself in Rostov-on-Don. Uh, Polenkov knew a lot about Billy's activities in Russia, um, and he had told uh, the family only a little bit. So I was determined to meet with him when I went to Russia, but unfortunately, he declined. I, I tried several ways and, and several times to, to meet with him, but it just didn't work out. As I recall the detail, Billy arrives in Moscow and he's met by not only Polenkov, but also Elena Gorbacheva. And they either meet him at the airport or meet him at the Kazan station. Who is she and how does she contribute? Yeah, Yelena Gorbacheva is a photojournalist, a Russian photojournalist. And by that point, she had been working, uh, she's in Moscow, but she'd been working in uh, Donbass and eastern Ukraine covering the war uh, for various Russian uh, publications for about for about a year uh, off and on. And she uh, she took in very interesting, intriguing photos of Billy uh, the day he arrived in Russia at uh, beside the train that he eventually took to Rostov. Um, and I reached out to her because I knew that she had at least uh, one or two pieces of this puzzle. She she knew Polenkov uh, and Polenkov had invited her to come and meet Billy. You also met with and spoke with uh, uh, someone you've known for many years called the general who guided you to Mikhailovskaya. Who is the general who is Mikhailovskaya? Yeah, so the general, obviously that's a nickname, but uh, it does refer to uh, the rank that he attained in, in one of the, the Russian uh, uh, services at some point. This is somebody I met in 2002 on my first visit to Russia and, and somebody who became a friend. You have to remember, of course, 2002, those were very different times. The relations between our countries were, were drastically different. Uh, Vladimir Putin was still a pretty new president. Uh, he was friendly with our president, George W. Bush. Uh, and they were cooperating in the war, uh, strikes in Afghanistan because we needed the air bridge over Russia. And Putin had signed the sympathy document at the embassy after the attack. Yes, yes, indeed. And, uh, and as, as is said many times, Putin was the first one to call Bush after the 9-11 attack, the first world leader. So um, just to give uh, your listeners uh, and viewers a greater context, uh, one might think that if you're running around Moscow with someone named the general today, um, it, 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 mean, it meant something very different back then. This is someone who became I became very friendly with uh, because, uh, you know, we, we've mentioned the sort of political friendship if you will, between the two countries at that time. But that also filtered down just to regular people. I found uh, that Russians uh, were eager to know me. Uh, I was eager to know them. And, uh, and there were easy and fast friendships made. And this was one of them. Um, so when I was looking for Billy, the general was one of the people that I shared this with because he had a lot of good contacts. And he eventually put me in touch with a woman who I had known years before, but had lost touch with, Nastya Mikhailovskaya, who eventually became a critical part of this uh, investigation. You were in Moscow, and now you're traveling to Rostov-on-Don. It's the summer of 2018. What is Rostov-on-Don? What does it look like? And the Don River, what does it look like there at, at the at Riverside? I was always fascinated by it before visiting because... Uh, uh, you know, many of your listeners and, and viewers, I'm sure, are aware of uh, And Quiet Flows the Dawn, the, um, the book uh, written by uh, Sholokhov, uh, the uh, Nobel laureate. Um, Sholokhov, excuse me. Um, and I always uh, was interested in getting down there because that was one of several sort of 
hosts of uh, the uh, Cossacks groups um, you know, way back, um, uh, way back when in history. And uh, so it's always been a fascinating place for me. When I got there, I found it to be a, a very interesting sort of, sort of well laid out city, um, fairly tidy. And of course you have the river, the Don River running through it. Uh, and when I when I visited in the summer that, uh, that year, it was interesting to find that there were there were wind surfers on the, on the Don. So uh, also they had uh, they had completed the uh, World Cup stadium because this, the soccer World Cup was being hosted in Russia and there were games being played there. The camp that Billy traveled to the volunteer camp, did it exist when you got there in summer of 18? The structure existed. Uh, it was on the, the banks of the Don River, kind of in the center of town, interestingly. Um, but there were very few people there. It had kind of been cleaned out. Uh, and there were various reasons for that. Um, one reason, of course, was the fact that the World Cup Stadium was was basically right behind it. And uh, uh, visitors coming for those games certainly didn't need to see such a thing. Now we need a detail, an administrative detail. Uh, con sure. uh, a confidential human source, a CHS. What is that in the world of intrigue, espionage, intelligence gathering, uh, police work? What does CHS represent? Well, as briefly as we can, we'll just say that uh, uh, the FBI, since its founding, always worked with uh, cooperators and informants. These are people who either were members of criminal uh, organizations or could access them. Uh, often people who were in legal jeopardy themselves and, and made a deal to work with the FBI to, to lighten their sentences. We've all seen these, these movies and TV shows, right? Well, after 9-11, uh, Capitol Hill and the administration mandated that the FBI start to become more of an intelligence agency in addition to being an, a law enforcement uh, body. Uh, and that meant that they had to start recruiting different kinds of informants and cooperators who could develop intelligence that would enable the FBI to sort of, to get ahead of criminal conspiracy, to get ahead of terrorist conspiracy. And in 2004, the, the FBI instituted what it called the Confidential Human Source Reengineering Project and it gathered all of these types of people into one category, Confidential Human Source or CHS. And that's the group that Billy joined. And that's the group that, that enlarged greatly after 9-11 as the FBI went out into the wider world. Mom and dad gave you information in that first interview and subsequent, because this is six months later, that we need to touch on here for the mystery of where Billy is. At one point, Billy left Rostov on Don and went on a, a train and bus trip into Russia. I believe he went to Volgograd, he went to Ulyanovsk. There were photographs sent to mom and dad over WhatsApp. What did they make of that trip? What did they want to know about that trip? Well, the Rileys just, the parents just didn't really know much of anything. Billy told them very little. Uh, he, he left on that trip, which I call the, his Volga sojourn, because it's uh, he, he sort of goes up the Volga region, up the Volga River, and hits these, these cities and towns that you mentioned. Uh, but he went off on that trip a day or so after arriving in Rostov-on-Don from Moscow, very soon after he arrived in Russia itself. Um, and this perplexed the, his parents, because they... They had understood that he wanted to be near the Ukrainian border to join one of these humanitarian convoys, uh, so-called humanitarian convoys. And the fact that he immediately went off on a sort of subset of, an, of his adventure uh, without explaining it or without telling them about it in advance of it uh, really left them wondering what he was up to. There were photographs. I believe there was one in front of a Ho Chi Minh statue. I don't remember. Was it a, a Lenin statue? And mom and dad wondered who took the picture. Right. There was, uh, he took a picture of a bust of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, he took, uh, he visited uh, Vladimir uh, Lenin's uh, childhood home in Uly Ulyanovsk and sent pictures from there. He just kept taking all kinds of snapshots as he went around Russia. And then there was a picture of him, of course, uh, finally, his, his own image um, at the uh, monument in uh, Volgograd, uh, the, the, the great monument to uh, the Battle of Stalingrad there. Uh, right. And of course, the parents wondered, who's behind the camera? 
Yes, hey, good question. One more detail about what you learned from mom and dad. Uh, the day or right contemporary with the last information they have from Billy, June 24th, 2015. They're visited by Tim Reinches. Who is that? What do we need to know about his visit? You know, he's a very important person for this story. Tim Reinches uh, at, the, at that time was an FBI agent, a case agent um, in counterterrorism. And uh, he was Billy Riley's main handler and had been for a number of years. And he and Billy talked incessantly for years uh, by phone, by text, by uh, other, uh, other apps. And they saw each other all the time. They saw each other sometimes uh, three times a week, uh, sometimes fewer times than that, but, but regularly and often. Um, and he would give... Billy, he would direct Billy's work for the FBI. So the fact that he shows up at the Riley house very soon after the parents lose communication with Billy is intriguing because Agent Reinches had never visited the house before. He had never met the parents. And his timing, of course, was very curious. Brett Forrest is the author. Lost Son is the book. An American family trapped inside the FBI's secret wars. There are secrets within secrets within secrets here. As a reader... I didn't expect to be ever introduced into the inner circle of what this means. It is now the summer of 2018. Brett is in Rostov on Don. He's meeting with a woman named Nastya Anastasia Mikhailovskaya, and they're talking about where did Billy go? Brett, at this point, you've been told by more than one Russian, well meaning Russian, He's disappeared into Russia, or you'll find him someday, or he'll come home. There's even the possibility that he's gone to the Far East to meet up with one of his contacts from those years of surfing for the FBI. But Mikhailovskaya has another fate for, or at least because she's a good mystery writer, she has another idea of fate. What is it? Well, Nastya and I were sitting on a veranda uh, that, that sort of jutted out into the Don River one uh summer afternoon that year we were at a, a hotel that was sort of cossack style hotel there were uh, there were large uh, iron uh, cannons that still worked um that, that were at the hotel and the staff wore sort of cossack tunics um very interesting place you felt you felt the intrigue there uh especially because rostov von don at that point especially was the sort of the staging point for all of Russia's military activities in the Ukrainian East. So Nastya and I were sitting there and, um, and I asked her what she thought had happened to Billy. And she said, very bluntly, she said, well, they would have uh, taken him into custody, tortured him for information, and then thrown his body uh, somewhere in a, in a lake in, uh, in LNR or DNR, one of the uh, so-called uh, republics in eastern ukraine and that was it it was it was one quick sentence she didn't think twice um and uh it made me think and that no one else has come up with remarks in fact they're very promising remarks from turin that you'll find him and that he's fine and all of that is credible given billy's spontaneity so now we go later on in the summer of 2018 brett is back in washington you'll help me with these dates brett and one evening, you were invited to an event at the Department of Justice. What is the event, and what did you learn? Yeah, this to me, it seemed like a spontaneous thing. I didn't know about this event beforehand. I was uh, with a uh, uh, source of mine who had become a friend over the years who was a former federal prosecutor. And we were in Washington just having a, a bite to eat, and, and he uh, invited me to this party. And he said that uh, it was a retirement party, for the gentleman who headed all terrorism cases at the Department of Justice, who had done so for a long time. He was a well-known guy in that world, very respected and liked. And um, anyhow, my friend and I, we got in a cab and we went to the party venue, which surprisingly was, at, was the Department of Justice itself. So we walked into the DOJ main building there and on Pennsylvania Avenue in, in Washington. And I found myself in, in quite a large uh, marble hall uh, where there, there were there was a bar there were hundreds of people there uh, these were federal prosecutors these were uh, uh, investigators in FBI and 
I was even more surprised later during the party to recognize a gentleman who was giving a toast. And his name was Paul Abate. And the reason he was important was because Paul Abate, at the time that Billy Riley went to Russia and disappeared there, was the head of the Detroit FBI office. Head of the Detroit office for all of the CHS. So Tim Reiches worked for Abate at the time. That's right. That's right. He, Paul Abate at that time was what is called the special agent in charge of the FBI's office in Detroit, the FBI field office. So he would have seen everything that Reinches learned from Billy and all of the visits to the house because they went on for weeks afterwards. There were many visits of FBI agents to the Rileys after Billy's disappearance. You approached Mr. Abate and your conversation. You asked him about Billy Riley. You were surprised. Why? Well, the substance of my conversation with Mr. Bate was uh, was off the record because he he requested that. But, it, but before he made that request, he uh, I told him why I wanted to speak with him, and it was about the Riley case. And he he interrupted me, and he said he said that he knew it, and he said that he knew me. Now I hadn't published anything about the Riley case yet, and by this point, Paula Bate was no longer the special agent in charge of the Detroit office of the FBI. Paul Abate at that point was the third highest ranking official in all of the FBI. He had been promoted way up the ranks and was an incredibly important and busy person for the FBI. So the fact that he immediately knew about the Riley case and that he had it top of mind told me more than probably he could ever really say himself. You have the clues. The book is Lost Son, an American family trapped inside the FBI's secret wars. Brett Forrest is the author. I'm John Batchelor.